Good evening. Welcome to the September 11th Kittleba Hills Board of Commissioners meeting. We will call this meeting to order. And first, if you would rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. comments this evening before we go into our moment of silence. Um, first, I don't know about you all, but standing there saying the pledge on a day like today, September 11th, Patriots Day, um, it brings back just a, a flood of emotions and, and um, feelings. Certainly it's a day as Americans that we won't forget, um, where we saw the worst in mankind come out, but yet we also saw some of the best in mankind and people joining together and helping one another and, and um, the camaraderie and the patriotism that um, was revitalized after such a horrific event. Um, so certainly call to everyone's um, attention that tonight before the moment of silence and continue to keep those that have had to move on because there's no other way but moving on you know, despite a loss of a loved one and, and those who served during that time. Also, we're on the heels of two catastrophic um, hurricanes between Texas and, and Florida. Um, you know, certainly where we live, we, we stay vigilant. We know that the threat is the same to us as it's there. Um, but we keep those that are that are in the aftermath in our thoughts and prayers this evening. Um, just a lot of tough days, but we also know that this is where it brings out the best in folks as well. So, um, Also, some of you, um, many of you know Howard Kimball. He's served our town in many ways through many years. Um, the planning board for a number of years. Just an update, he underwent surgery recently and is doing well, um, but please keep him and his wife Doris in your thoughts and prayers. Um, I also ask that you keep Crystal Smith. She's with our um, police department, a police officer. Her grandmother um, passed away recently. So with all of that, um, I will lead us into just a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Thank you all, all of you that are here this evening with us. Um, it's nice to see friendly faces in the crowd. Um, I think a lot of you are here for one particular agenda item, the public hearing, so you'll have an opportunity to speak in a few minutes on that. Um, but first, we will go, just a formality, we'll do agenda approval. So moved. I'll second. Any discussion, comments? All those in favor, please signal saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, which it does bring us straight into our public hearing. That's on the requested amendment, amendments to section 152.37 subdivision general standards and section 153.120 low density residential zone site requirements, specifically to decrease minimum lot size for new subdivisions in the RL zone subject to certain conditions. So our town attorney is going to walk us through the process first of how we conduct public hearings, and then we'll move forward. Thank you, Mayor. Um, go over a couple rules here. Uh, first off, a public notice of this hearing was published in the newspaper and posted on the town bulletin boards in accordance with statutory requirements for the subject matter. A copy of this public notice has also been filed with the town clerk for entry into the official record of the hearing. The town clerk will record all oral arguments in a concise and brief manner. Written statements shall be recorded in a similar manner and made a part of the record of the hearing. It shall be submitted to the, in full to the town clerk. Uh, if speaking tonight, uh, please limit your comments to matters relevant to the issue and to a time period of three minutes. Uh, there will be an exception made if you're here as a spokesperson on behalf of a group. At that point, you'd be given five minutes to speak. Uh, when coming to the microphone, um, please, please announce and announce your name for the record and, and speak clearly. Um, and with that, the public hearing is going to please come to order. This hearing is called for the purpose of the Kildover Hills Board of Commissioners to consider requested amendments to Chapter 152.37 Subdivision General Standards and Chapter 153.120 Low Density Residential Zones Site Requirements, specifically to decrease the minimum lot size for new subdivisions in the RL Zone subject to certain conditions. I do have the list in front of me of those who signed up. Um, 
So at this point, uh, Robert Rook, am I reading that correctly? Okay, perfect. If you would, Mr. Rook, come up to the... Come up there. Right there to that post. <laughs> okay. So ladies and gentlemen, commissioners, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the opportunity to speak on these, on, make my comments about the proposal that's going on here. My name is Robert Rook. I've been a resident here for 42 years in Dare County and a resident in Wright Woods for the last 14 years. My property, I share a common boundary with the track that is going to be developed on my my south boundary is common with his, and my northeast corner is common with his southeast corner at the Park Service. I do have some concerns. Back 14 years ago when I built my house, I had to bring in a lot of fill for it. And I kept, and I kept in mind my neighbors as I was, as the project progressed. And I kept myself in check as to the amount of fill I put on there with consideration to him. Now, I have walked this property on numerous occasions, and I'm sorry to say that I did not discover a nesting pair of the endangered rock cockatiel woodpecker. <laughs> but I did notice that there are elevations in there that are quite low, lower than what I started with when I built my place. That being said, I have this vision, nightmare vision, of my side yard becoming a retention pond for development that is, that is put, in, put there next to me. And especially in light of, I understand the rule for, uh, for fill is up to six feet on an adjacent property. That being the case, then it's like, that would be almost like a levy to me. Now, so I am hoping that as this project progresses, that restrictions or, or, or focus will be put on that to ensure that stormwater runoff does not affect the adjacent neighborhood. I think I speak for everybody living up Telegraph Court, I mean, up, up Parkwood Drive, because we all share the same boundary line. Other than that, um, most of my concerns were that I had listed were status quo as opposed to what the exceptions are being uh, at. I understand that's, that's a moot point now, that the die has been cast, that we are either going to have condos or we're going to have 7,500 square feet lots in there. That being said, I certainly would rather have a single family dwelling room subdivision than condos. But it, that is what it's gonna be. So let me look at my notes, see I'm sure I'm gonna miss something here. But I really do hope that as the town the town as these plans are submitted and come forward that attention will be paid to the drainage detail on that you know, as, as how it will affect the adjacent neighbors. I thank you for your time. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reed Corbett. Uh, good evening. Reed Corbett. I, I live at uh, 1403 Harpoon Court, which is cul-de-sac or currently a cul-de-sac adjacent to this property. Um, maybe I'm speaking for a group because uh, I certainly talked with my neighbors prior to coming forward. Um, I want to start out by saying that I'm certainly in no means arguing for a multifamily unit. So I'll make that blanket statement. Um, and in fact, based on sort of the proposal that I have read, if, if our current rules, if the town's current rules are such that they allow for 130 multifamily units on 21 acres, we should reevaluate our rules. My understanding is the way it's worded is we shouldn't be doing this west of 158. But regardless, if that's what our rules state, we should 
have another look at our rules. Um, <clears throat> I find it interesting that we are, are making these proposals come forward, these changes are potentially being made sort of in the face of what we're currently being asked to look at, which is our land use plan. There's currently a survey out that's open, I think, through the end of the month. Um, and so there's this land use survey where you're, you're surveying your constituencies, but yet we're talking about zoning changes today. And I find that odd, but let's, let's go with that. Let's go back to our last land use plan and look at um, some of the results from that one, 1997. Roughly 78% of the respondents strongly disagreed or disagreed that, quote, existing residential zone rules should be relaxed to allow greater density and greater variety, variety of uses. Roughly 90% agreed or strongly agreed that existing low density residential zone around Wright Brothers National Memorial should be maintained. 62% agreed or strongly agreed that additional fam multifamily condominium developments should be prohibited west of US 158. Approximately 78% agreed or strongly agreed that the town should develop and implement regulations to prohibit the removal or depletion of natural vegetation. That was 97. We're currently going through a similar process. I'd be, you know, we aren't going to know what the town wants once your constituencies actually want until that survey comes back. Making a change now seems a bit premature. That said, again, I'm not arguing for multifamily units. The reduction of lot size suggested by SOG has been proposed based on an economic feasibility, right? They aren't going to make their money unless they get at least what they suggest is 75 to 80 homes, I believe. And I assume that's where this arbitrary half of what the current lot size is, right? So 7,500 square feet, it's a good, you know, round number, let's divide by two. I assume there is some um, actual numbers behind that, some economic feasibility and a study behind that. Because what I would be curious, what if we reduced it to 10,000 square feet? What if it was reduced to 12,000 square feet? I have no doubt the numbers have been done. We, the people, have not seen those. We've just seen this, let's half it. And it does seem arbitrary to somebody that's just reading that. The current, the average, as was stated, the average lot size in the area is about 8,500. If we want to keep the neighborhood the same, 8,500 seems like a good number. The current ordinance or the proposed ordinance suggests, and this is a 13 or 152.373E, that 25% of all the lots shall exceed the minimum lot size requirements. If this is the pass, I would suggest that, that be reworded so that you actually define what that minimum lot size requirement is based on the reading. I assume it would be 7,500 square feet. And what that must exceed, 7,600 square feet exceeds 7,500. And so 7,500 and one exceeds 7,500. And so I, I think that should be defined if we're actually going to go this route, because clearly SAGA is trying to define what our zoning ordinances are. Finally, um, I, I do find it surprising that we are looking at potential increased density in a time where we're dealing with stormwater runoff, we're dealing with higher groundwater tables, we're dealing with enhanced water inundation. We're working in an area that we just heard is actually fairly low line. These things, I'm sure, are being considered. We're moving into a time where this is only going to get more challenging. These are things that we have to consider as a town as we move forward and we plan accordingly. Right? We develop smart and we think about all of these things moving forward. I'm not sure by increasing density we're doing that, whether it's multifamily use or single family use. <coughs> so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Any other uh, members of the public that would like to speak? Saw that. Thank you. I'm Nancy Stevens. I live at 615 Seeloff Court. Uh, we've lived there for almost 20 years. I've been in the community of Kill Devil Hills for 30 years. I know Mike Midget from my teaching days at Mania High School. Uh, my concern has to do with stormwater issues that we currently have along Landing Drive. Uh, the last big storm, Matthew, water was coming up 
through the drainage system and flooding the cul-de-sac that I sit on. Uh, the water came into our garage. In almost 20 years, we've never had that happen. And it was the town's system that was being overloaded. And that may have something to do with Lowe's, quite honestly. I truly believe that. Uh, folks that live along there have noticed the same sort of things. With more pavement, we've got more issues with stormwater issues. And, and the stormwater isn't draining. It's just sitting there in those pipes. And when we get overloaded with large rains, it comes right back up out. So high-density housing, um, as he just explained, it is going to create more of that same problem. And so if we're going to go in this direction, then what are we going to start doing in our community for those issues? So that's what I would ask you to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Dave Halleck. I live at 1301 West 1st Street, and I am representing myself and my family only right now with my comments. I'd start by just saying that I uh, respect the uh, uh, ability for the owners. I, I believe the owners of the property now are Saga Construction, but I'm not certain, uh, to develop the property as theirs, and uh, I do respect that. Uh, I do feel like we're in a bit of a tight situation here. Uh, there's no question that having multi-family homes in this area could be problematic in terms of traffic and congestion in the area. And to be very honest about it, there are very many people in the area that are concerned about the value of their properties and how that may be affected by any development in the area. So that's a concern. Uh, I believe that we would support the uh, zoning change uh, if it's an either-or situation, meaning uh, multi-family homes versus a 7,500 square foot minimum lot size. Uh, I agree with some of the other comments earlier. That's a pretty small lot. 50 feet wide as a minimum is, is pretty small. And it doesn't appear that uh, having certain lots that are, uh, are to some degree larger than that without explaining how much larger is problematic. Uh, I happen to look my entire uh, southern boundary of my property comes up against this property. There is a water management issue in the area. I wish I had taken videos uh, or I could show you some videos when, when we have uh, large rainstorms. I'd be happy to show Saga as well where all the low spots are, although I'm sure their surveyors can do a much better job than I can. But there's a river that forms on that property uh, in between the backyards of folks on Parkwood and my property that then flows out to the ditch on West First Street. And there's no question in my mind that when these sites appropriately are raised with fill yep. for development, the water goes to its lowest point, and that will most likely be our properties and the road. Uh, so I, I think there's some significant uh, planning challenges that we have here, and I hope uh, that we can work together uh, with Saga and with the town to, to mitigate those appropriately. I would also ask uh, our commissioners and, and the, the town in general if they could perhaps serve as a liaison. My understanding is Saga has been very open-minded and uh, professional in its willingness to speak with uh, the local community and the neighborhoods about this project. And if there's an opportunity for us all to get together, speak in a civil manner about their plans and see if there are ways that we can uh, um, work with them to help them achieve their goals in a manner that doesn't disrupt the flavor and uh, benefits of the community that we're enjoying. I think that would be great. The final comment I have is uh, related to wildlife management. We already have a wildlife management challenge in Kill Devil Hills. There are between five and ten uh, coyotes that utilize Wright Brothers, utilize the surrounding property, which is wonderful, but there are conflicts in a high density uh, residential area. In addition, there are, uh, there's a herd of about 20 to 30 white-tailed deer. And uh, again, although I respect the, the rights of the property owners to develop the land appropriately, uh, there is going to be a further challenge when these deer no longer have that particular property utilized and um, you know, in increased opportunities for vehicle collisions and other issues. So that's just something for us to collectively consider. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> from the public? Mm. Members of the uh, yeah. Patty Armstead, and I really don't have a dog in this fight, but uh, 
I think that uh, zoning ordinances and uh, zoning restrictions were very well illustrated the importance of them with these past few storms. Uh, you look at Florida and the damage done there and look at the town of Houston where they have no zoning ordinances at all. Um, so as you're considering zoning, you know, keep that in mind. The ordinances, zoning ordinances are uh, very important for public safety. Anyone else? Thank you. Members of the uh, applicant would like to speak? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hello, good evening. My name is Sumit Gupta with Saga Construction. I just want to thank the uh, mayor or the commissioners uh, for the time and consideration in, in reviewing this proposal. And I also appreciate everyone else here. Um, even if you don't agree with this proposal, I'm a big believer in a healthy debate and being able to go through this process. So I appreciate everyone's input. Also, some of the the points brought up today, I think, are very valid and good questions, and I'm going to try to address some of those through um, some of my points here. I want to start off by saying that, again, this text amendment, and I realize, is a town-wide change, even though it impacts mostly, I think, two, uh, and the mayor, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think two properties that are over five acres are impacted by the sixth tax amendment. Correct. That's okay. for right now in the residential low zone. In the residential low. So I know we can't single out, but everybody knows the parcel that we're talking about. So just at least for the sake of conversation, and, and I think we can um, use it as an example of what impact this tax amendment can have on a parcel like that. A brief history of this right here. So we, we put this property under contract. It was zoned, it was allowable to have multifamily, so our vision was originally multifamily based on land acquisition prices and just based on the current code. It was a very quick conversation about single family lots. It wasn't even in the realm of feasible. So it was multifamily. I spent time, money, Invested into going multifamily, we we came up with some plans, and, I, and that's when I started having a dialogue with town staff. And from those dialogues, they were like, "Well, wait a minute, this may, you know, even though it's allowable, I don't think this is going to be well received in that in that area." So from that, I just went back and started thinking about it. I'm like, "Well, I don't know what other this doesn't make sense, and I can't make it work any other way." So that's when the idea of, you know, I think we would consider a change in lot size. So from that, I, we went into it, and the 7,500, which is a point, you know, was it arbitrary? No, it wasn't. It, it's not arbitrary. I mean, there's no perfect science of 76 or 74, but um, there was consideration put into that, and I'm going to you know, come back to the lot size. Um, but... With the multifamily, we ended up with about 130 units. And when we were discouraged to go with the multifamily, because I get it, I mean, it's different than the surrounding areas. You would have larger buildings. You would have bigger parking lots. Obviously, those parking lots would need to be lit up just by code and all the other infrastructure that goes into multifamily. So, so I get it, but I want to say, and I hate to, you know, I don't even like the fact that it's this or this, right? It's not even like... But yes, multifamily is allowed, and multifamily is the direction we would go if this text amendment is not approved. And, and I want to say another point there, even look at the economics. We are, even though this text amendment is pretty much presented to increase density, right? You're, you're basically cutting the lot size in half to increasing density. Another perspective is actually the density is going down in this proposal from 130 units to probably 70 to 75. So it's just a different, you know, if you're weighing those two options, we're actually, this allows some, us to consider the other option. 
or before it's not even a consideration. And I also want to point, it's not still the highest and best in terms of numbers and, and execution and ROI, it's still, it's, it's still compelling to go to multifamily. But when we look at ROI in the sense of PR and community and everything, and you know, we're here, it's not about trying to maximize one project or community. It starts saying, you know what, we can live with this. We can live with the overall low ROI if we believe this community will be better accepted. And from our side, I mean, even though it doesn't look like it, it's, 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 it's somewhat of a concession to go that, to get that route. So I just want to put that in for consideration. You know, with all that said, ironically, you know, me and my partners, we're perfectly okay with however this decision plays out. I just want to be able to say, you know, if this was approved, we're going to go in this direction. If this wasn't, we're going to go back to where I started <laughs> three, four months ago. And at least I can proceed with that knowing that we explored both options. I can go back with a clear head that this is allowable, even though some people may not agree. And we're following the rules, and it's allowable, and that's the direction we would go. A few other things to consider. You know, there's this conversation about large lots, small lots. But there's so much to it because if you end up going to a larger lot, I don't think you dramatically, it doesn't give you less impact. People build larger homes, right? And really, the lot sizes don't get wider. You're going to still, you're going to end up with narrow, long lots. So in the end, how I look at this, you know, we, we're taking some of the, some of that, land that just makes a lot a long narrow lot and putting it into open space and other amenities that actually add to aesthetics and the property we're looking at an example again you know we ended up with just as we developed it allowing for 7500 it actually allows you to put a diverse mix of lots our lots in these in, in our proposed development have ranged from about 7,500 to 13 to 14,000 square feet. Our average is actually closer to 85 to 9,000, just to give a perspective on that. And what we're ending up doing is some larger lots, some are larger, some are smaller, and some on the smaller lots we're just taking that additional space and put it into open space. So with a mix of all of this, I believe you're going to end up with aesthetically a better neighborhood. I think also it's not going to be any more impactful because you're not, you're not building larger houses. A lot of the 75, you're limited to three, four bedroom houses. So I don't believe from, you know, that you're going to end up with a higher impact <clears throat> development on this property. Someone brought up a comment about, well, right now it says 25% of lots can be greater than 7,500. And I get it because you're like, why well, didn't go to 7,501? In practicality, you wouldn't want that. A 7,500 lot has an 8-foot setback. In a 7,501 has a 10-foot side setback. So a 7,501 7, lot is actually less developed than a 7,500 square foot. So if you're going to go to 7,501, you're really going to go to eight or 9,000 square foot. That's what I've seen when we did the site planning. That's why we left as simple as greater than 7,500 because the rest of it pretty much takes care of itself. You're going to go greater than that. And some of the other things we did, I mean, it wasn't strictly about, you know, we, we made the conditions also to put sidewalks in the community because we believe walkable communities are better, they're safer. We believe that roads need to be built to state standards and really should be controlled by the, the townships. And so these are some of the things we worked through, even though it's more expensive to add sidewalks on one side and, and things like that. I mean, it, it wasn't strictly about how do we squeeze everything out of it. I think we were just trying to do a feasible community, um, but still trying to do it the right way. There was a comment about drainage. 
I want to say we're just as concerned about drainage. Any, I mean, any lot you build on the beach, you have to consider drainage. This is not something we're building one house. If this doesn't work, if there's flooding around, it impacts, we're vested into that. It's going to, we're going to have a hard time selling this property. So, but another thing, it's not just about our motivation there, trying to do the right thing. I mean, it's controlled by town and state rules. We can't just drain, our, our, our stormwater has to drain to the front, swales, and then it has to tie into the, the you know, the, the town, the town plan, stormwater plan. So it's not as simple as, that's heavily got, you know, restricted and there's a lot of guidelines around that. So. Uh, that is something that's going to be vetted um, in, in many ways. But, but I don't see this act just having runoff to neighboring properties. We're not allowed to do that. Someone brought the, you know, um, the point about having the opportunity, if this goes through, to sit down and kind of talk about the community. Well, we, I brought it here. I can show you. Last time at the planning board meeting, uh, I met a few people. I welcomed them. I'm like, come by the office. You may have some good ideas and recommendations on how to do this better or be more conscious about it. So I still welcome everybody here. Anybody who wants to have input into this, we welcome it. And we think we'll end up with a better community, however it results in that. Anyway, I think that, that covered some of these points about stormwater, about the lot size. Um, you know, again, I just appreciate you guys giving this consideration. We're truly fine with having this place, but I do believe this is the, in the best interest of the town and the residents. I think it gives another option. Otherwise, you force these properties into multifamily. And in the end, it is about economics. It's part of, you know, how it's going to result. And I think this gives a developer another option and that's what we're playing you know we, that's what our plan is so and I appreciate thank you for all your input and I appreciate your consideration of this. thank you thank you thank you thank you anyone else want to speak yep Everybody doing? Uh, Skip Jones, 1508 Captain's Lane. Um, been resident this area about 40 years, and in that area, particularly for about 30 or so. Um, I was actually on the planning board when we passed this one with our ideas to, with a favorable motion to the commissioners. Um, I've got to admit, I, you know, I didn't really feel great about it the whole time, and then since only because I did feel like it was one or the other. You know, I, I hate feeling trapped like that. But, um, you know, and I thought along, you know, we could reduce it, 8,500, 10,000. I heard him say something tonight, which made a lot of sense to me in one respect, but I haven't heard anything about it up to this point. If the average lot size is actually going to be 8,500, then why not have a part of that, this, Proposal that says minimum lot size is 7,500 with the average being 8,500 or 9,000. I mean, that would make, I know that would make me feel a lot better being on the planning board. And I think Kitty Hawk's getting ready to go through the same thing, actually. But, um, you know, I think that makes a lot more sense than everybody envisioning a whole row of 7,500 square foot lots. I know it would make me feel a lot better. So, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Joel Lupinton. Um, I live at 615 Seagolf Court. Um, I've been a resident of uh, Kill Devil Hills for 31 years. I've lived at my residence for about 20 now. And um, uh, a couple things were brought up. And if we, um, uh, the traffic on Landing Drive, what will that do to that road? It's already a narrow uh, roadway as it is. Uh, we've seen increased traffic since Lowe's was put in, 
And now we're going to add another 85 ohms onto that. So you figure each one of those has got two cars. So you'll increase that use every day. Um, <clears throat> as far as the uh, stormwater runoff, um, oftentimes there's water running into the cul-de-sac on sea off court that all piles up on the back end of the property. No one sees it because it's, um, it's not in their backyard. Um, and it's often that it's back there. Um, <clears throat> it runs away from the um, sores, storm sores, storm drains in the front of the property, which are out on landing drive. So there's already a problem with the stormwater runoff uh, on that large lot that uh, Dave and Robert and Nancy and anybody else who lives over there experiences on a heavy rain. So um, I think you need to look at some other issues as well. Thank you. Could you uh, repeat your name? I'm sorry, sir. I missed oh. it. Uh, Joe Lupitin, L-U-P-E-T-I-N. Sherry Rollison, 533 Myrtle Court, and I've been here in Cadillac Hills um, for since 1971, and been in White Woods since uh, 1985. Um, as I have said at the planning board level, and I spoke at the last commissioners' meeting uh, briefly on that. I think the subdivision that we have is workable. I think that the, um, it can be compatible to First Flight and the Landing and Wright Woods. The main concern is, and I'm glad that uh, Mr. Good got here and made you know some of the things we're talking about that the actual average lot size would be more 8,500 or 9,000. I'm like Mr. Jones that relieved me a lot because I still kept envision on this minimum sticking with the 7,500 square feet and seeing another Virginia Dare Shores or, you know, um, Avalon Beach with a little bit larger with the home so close together. Um, and adding with the open space, the amount of open space and stuff that would be there to take some of the smaller lots that would be in there and incorporate it into open space, I think we could have a very pleasing, very good project going on, um, provided that, and I know it's going to be difficult, and what I cringe about is going in there and slicking and then doing, and I know that that's probably going to be the easiest way to do it, but please plant some more trees back, and not palm trees. <laughs> please, <laughs> not palm trees. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm for this zoning order to be changed. Just make sure the language is there and what have you, and that we can have a subdivision with single-family dwellings. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? There being no further public comment on this item, at this time the Board of Commissioners will start conducting discussion and make their own comments prior to uh, public viewing being closed and action takes. <coughs> start with comments or questions. Meredith is available too if you have any specific questions in addition to the applicants. Okay. Uh, is this going to be on the septic plant system or is this going to be? Yes. It is? Yes. Septic. I mean, septic. Not, it's septic. 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 Not, I'm sorry. Not, not, not central. Not, okay. sewage. not in that area. This is septic. Tank. That's, yes. that's what I thought. Okay. Yes. And, uh, yeah, because I believe there's some an email written about a concern that perks. Right. And so I just want to make sure it's going to be. I think Suma has spent a lot of time with the health department making sure that the land perks before <laughs> yeah. it got into this. Quite a bit. Yeah. We have it, done studies. We've done soil things. study, survey. It's going to be on septic and <laughs> on site septic. Okay. There seems to be a lot of concern with the wastewater runoffs here. Storm water. So, storm storm water. Storm water, sorry. 
is is this system that they're referring to is it on, scheduled to be repaired or is it? You know, it's, I'm, I'm you probably going to I'm probably going to throw that to Derek, but <coughs> I will. I, and I, he hasn't been here that long, so I don't want to throw him under the bus. But that system was actually upgraded within the past decade. Um, a large portion of the system was culvert piped and um, upgraded, and the and the ditches are regularly maintained. Um, Tote was actually just out there about three weeks ago uh, when someone questioned the system. The system does work. Some of the lots are a little bit lower. Um, than, than the existing road, and it was just the way that the topography in the area is, and I understand that concern, but the town stormwater system is maintaining all of our stormwater within the right-of-way and, and moving it effectively to the sound. Eric, anything to add? So um, when it rains. To add to it, they do have, we're all required to have state stormwater permit for some additional storage on site, and of course, when the system comes before us, Pete will be studying it. We will be studying it to ensure that the system is adequate. There's a few steps that we may have jumped at this point. This, again, is an amendment that's a town code amendment. If this amendment is approved, then the applicant would come to us with a subdivision, which would also go to the Planning Board and Board of Commissioners. If the subdivision is approved, then he goes forward with a street improvement Planned, an engineered plan that would be approved by public services, be reviewed by the town engineer, and all the storm water be done. And then each site as it's built will come to the planning department for review as a single family dwelling. And there are rules about impacts to adjacent property owners with, with storm water. So there's several more steps that the board and the planning board and the public will get to see. Um, regarding how it's going to be set up and how the stormwater is is proposed and, and, and how that's all going to... So, we, in talking about a specific project, you get a little ahead of yourself. And I understand he was using it as an example, but it, it, it brought us into tunnel vision. Again, this is a text amendment, and once the text amendment is approved or denied, then you'll go into specifics of a particular site. Yes, and I, I definitely know where I'm at, and full disclosure, I have an extremely vested interest being right there. Um, but I, I think, again, we need to look at even, and I, and I explained this to a group of people, actually the landing association that, that happened to have a meeting this weekend. I, I explained to them as well that I think even had I not been living right there, I would still have the same thought process because I think... I think the subdivision actually adds to the neighborhoods that are there as it is. And even, even if I didn't have a house right there on the corner, I would still, as a commissioner, look at that and go, okay, if we're looking at this as condos being built in the middle of these two subdivisions, which are the two, two of the nicest subdivisions in Kildable Hills, really, versus some condos being built in the middle of the subdivision, um, what would be in the best interest of the people were that to be a decision that I needed to make without any input from anyone. And my thought process would be the subdivision, um, even if the lots are a little bit smaller than they are right now. Now, I've had the pleasure of looking at the actual plat, so I, I, I have a little bit more insight and, and know that the average lot size is a little bit bigger. So... Um, I think this is a, a smart idea, and I know it's laid out very well with some green space, and 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 it's done very tastefully. But um, and and nothing against condos, but I don't know that we have the infrastructure. Somebody brought up traffic, and and having you know seventy, you know, being able to handle the traffic from seventy eight houses with two cars each. Well, double that if you do condos, and and you think about the traffic. So. 
again, that's that's my not only my concern with the traffic, but also the fact that you make that a commercial area with all the children and the pets and the again the the lighting alone. I, I work in a commercial area right here and have the lights at night sometimes, and I and I think about my house right there with those lights that'll be there all the time, and that's. That's huge when you're talking about your home. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm thinking about. So I, I just think there's a lot of things to think about here. And yes, it, it was, again, there's, there's a lot of things we probably need to read through in, these, in this zoning ordinance to, to see what, we, what we've had and what we've missed and what we don't. And I, it was a great idea, whoever said it, that we need to look at it. Promise you, that's coming. Um, thank you for that suggestion. Um, but there's nothing we can do about that right now. So, um, but I, but I think you're right. It's right now. This is what we need to do, and it's not necessarily just the lesser of twos. But I do want to thank the summits for for working with us because I don't think people have given them the credit they deserve because this really has been a concession for them. They didn't they didn't have to do this. They could have just presented this as is. As, as a condo and, and gone forward and said, you know, I don't really care if it works or not for y'all. This is, it's zoned correctly. I'm not doing anything wrong. But you really have done what you thought was in the best interest of the community. And I appreciate, thank you for that, because I think you really did kind of get the feel when people started looking at you when you said condos and we went, huh? So I, I appreciate your your consideration on, on that and the factor because you, you are taking a hit with your ROI on that. So thank you. Yeah, I had a talk with Meredith at one point and I, I said the same thing about 7,500, you go 7,501 and she explained it to me that it doesn't make a bit of sense to do that with the setbacks you have to go. I don't know what the figure is, you could probably figure it out how big you'd have to go to, to make the bigger setbacks work for you, um, and I'm glad that was explained also. Um, uh, the survey, uh, land use plan and survey, pre previous ones were mentioned, and the percentages, and I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, we went through that a lot with, uh, with building height and some other things that uh, there was uh, very high percentages like a run. 88 or 90 on uh, being against any higher buildings. So I am s sympathetic to that. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't be fair to the developer, and it wouldn't be fair to anyone that wanted to do something to hold up until we have the survey and see what people think now, and then wait even if, at the extreme, wait for the land use plan to see what kind of stuff we like to have done in time. They filed uh, their request in a <coughs> timely manner, and it's it's been handled through uh, various stages with the planning department and the planning board. And uh, I don't think they want to wait until we get our land use plan done. Uh, the biggest thing to me is this aesthetically, and I, there's a few places in town that have condos, uh, townhouse condo type things, and there's well, park, kind of cars parked out front. And, uh, if I envision that, and I envision a neighborhood with mo you know modest homes, three or four bedrooms at most, probably. Uh, if it was my neighborhood, I'd rather see the houses than look across the street and see a four uh, four family house or something like that with uh, eight cars parked in front of it. So the biggest thing to me is just the aesthetics of it and the flavor of the neighborhood. And uh, I appreciate the uh, the efforts that uh, SAGA went to to have the open space and the sidewalks and um, the right of ways to be dedicated to the town. I think that's there's a couple things there that they don't have to do, but they're going to do. So I give them a little bit of credit for that. So I'm I'm okay with it. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, you know, I, it's um, the tone of the meeting tonight is um, heavy or intense versus some of our meetings. And I think the reason it's that way, it's not a negative thing. It's because it's a big decision. I know for me personally, I've reached out to a couple of people and um, um, spoken to them prior to the meeting, recognizing it's a big decision and we want to make the right decision because it impacts so many of our citizens and it's, you know, you're, it's impacting the future of the town. Um, that being said, um, I think my big takeaways from prior conversations and certainly from tonight is that two of the things would be at the point of when site plans are, are presented, which is the stormwater and the traffic. I mean, I think those would be the times where we will be having to look very seriously at that and and um, making sure that we have the confidence in those plans that they're going to address the concerns that you brought forth. I'm grateful the gentlemen are here this evening to hear that too. Um, I can tell from your pre presentation, um, you know, that yes, this is a business decision, but that, you know, you're also part of this community. You live in KDH, you get it. Um, and I'm glad you were here to hear their concerns and address those. Um, I think one thing that's not, um, that I, I don't have a, it's not going to be built into how do we address it was the comment brought up about the wildlife management um, that, that Dave brought up. Um, we've got some good experts in our community. I know Aaron's here this evening. We're going to hear a presentation from Aaron McCall. Um, I do think at some point that that conversation needs to be had, but it wouldn't be built into a you know, prescribed plan. Um, but I think we need to sit down and talk about that. Um, if nothing else, so we can also prepare our citizens for what they need to and could expect and, and then what we can do to protect ourselves. We've already had a presentation once about coyotes because we had great concerns from our citizens. They were seeing um, more coyote sightings and so on and so forth. So I do want to be mindful of that as we move forward as well. Um, personally, when I look at the options, I think the um, this, this amendment um, presents a better option for the town than the, the condo units or, well, excuse me, not necessarily condo, but multifamily. Um, so I think on, on the surface from there, I certainly support the change for that. And I think our work as a board is still very much cut out for us and the planning board as we review the plans in the next stages that come forth. So, um, that any final comments from the board or if not um, we move into taking action the, the thing you mentioned about wildlife is not obviously again is not specific to this property uh, it's the same um, as it was for some projects that have been done here and there are some plots of land mm -hmm. that are going to be maybe affected in the future and uh, that is a consideration I think we have to look into Any other comments or thoughts? Okay. If not, um, would a member like to make a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the requested amendment to 152.37 subdivision general standards and 153.120 low density residential zones site requirements to decrease minimum lot size for new subdivisions in the RL zone subject to certain conditions. Also, the Board of Commissioners finds that the amendment to 152.37 uh, subdivisions general standards and 153.120 low density residential zones site requirements to decrease minimum lot size for new subdivisions in the RL zone subject to certain conditions, and these are consistent with all comprehensive plans or other officially adopted plans of the town of Kildable Hills, and that the, the amendment is reasonable in the public interest because it helps protect the aesthetics of the neighborhood involved. Okay, a motion. And a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Thank you. And thank you all very much for coming out and sharing your, your input this evening. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to the first opportunity set aside for public comment this evening. Have a good night. Thank you all for coming. Thank you okay so this is the first opportunity this evening for public comment in general if you want to wish to address the board on any topic um same rules you know i'm actually speaking to that most of you come to a lot of meetings so you know the rules but anyway um if you're speaking on behalf of an, as an individual three minutes if it's a group five minutes um you would just come to the podium identify yourself by name and address We'll start with the sign-up sheet if anyone, no one signed up, so we'll just call from the floor. Yes, welcome back, Mr. Corbett. Is that right? I just, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, I appreciate the, sorry, Reed Corbett, 1403 Harpen Court. Um, I appreciate the position that you were in and making a vote like that. Um, I want to encourage you again that we reevaluate our zoning rules to not be put in a position like that. That is not the only five acre lot. I mean, it's a shame that <clears throat> your arm is basically being twisted in order to uh, keep the town how your constituents want it. And that's that's so <coughs> frustrating, I know, for you as well as everybody else. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak at this public comment time? More hands? Thank you. Um, response to public comment, your comment both times, duly noted. We appreciate it. Thanks for, for being here. <coughs> yeah, I know what you, I, when you said about our arm being twisted, and I, I know that's a euphemism, and, you know, being given, um, a, what was it called, Hobson's Choice, where no matter what you do, nobody's, somebody's not going to like it, and, but, uh, they, there was, there was nothing, that Saget did that out of the ordinary for what happens every day in town dealing with developments and such. Uh, I don't feel like I've had a gun to my head uh, or my arm was being twisted. I looked at it and, and made that decision. But I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Um, we'll move on now to next agenda item is introductions and presentations and welcome Aaron McCall with the Nags Head Woods annual report and an update on access to fresh pond. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Aaron, is the clicker over there? Uh, I don't see it. If you'll just raise your finger, we'll get you more. <laughs> all right. No problem. Like I said, once again, thanks for uh, letting me speak on behalf of uh, Nature Conservancy and Naxhead Woods. Uh, I will kind of briefly go over our annual report, um, and I will also go into a little bit more details about fresh pond and things of that nature. At any point, if you have any questions about any slide that's up there or want more detail, just let me know. A lot of this came from uh, the written report that you guys should have received, um, but I'll just kind of go over some of the right details uh, through this. Uh, this is just a picture of our new deck area. Um, and uh, I want to thank the Outer Banks Visiting Bureau for uh, for some of the grant funding to help support that effort. I'll go into a little more details of that, but it's a nice picture of it. Uh, so let me go over just a few things. Uh, we have a few new staff out there, visitor service, our, our deck, renovation areas. I'll go into the herbology study, uh, looking at the turtles, deer management, uh, pollinator habitat, fresh pond and fishing, and outreach and community events. So, like I said, we have a few new staff, Jennifer Gilbert's back with us, the Nature Conservancy, and Eric Silverman, who's also working with us. Uh, he's our restoration specialist that helps us with different projects throughout the area. Uh, most of our work goes beyond Naxhead Woods and actually covers the whole northeast region. So, uh, the staff that's in the Naxhead Woods office covers other different projects outside of the, the preserve. Also, uh, visiting services uh, for the past couple years, uh, for this past annual year. Uh, 
About 10,000 visitors come through and sign our visitor books. That's just for hiking, wildlife, viewing, things of that nature. Uh, our facility has been used by North Carolina Aquarium, uh, multiple different other. Uh, we've had Kitty Hawk Kayak been back there hiking. We've had the uh, Dare County uh, Sheriff Department back there with some of their campers. Uh, we've had our facility used by Wildlife Resource Commission to hold meetings and things like that. Uh, and we've seen a lot more activity along the road, and our parking area and stuff is, is being flipped more often. So we're definitely seeing more people come through the door, so to speak. Um, and with that being said, I started talking with both KDH and X. Said, Please, Department, just talk about some of the issues with the road and parking and stuff like that. Uh, so like I said, we did secure some funding uh, from the Outer Banks Visiting Bureau to help uh, redo our decks. It's now to, uh, it's down to ADA compliance. Uh, we also have incorporated water fountains. Uh, some of the few things that we've had, we've tried to get uh, input from visitors and some of our stuff was just the shape that the deck was, uh, widening our walkway. Uh, we have a better vista view now. We have stainless cables so you look out to the pond. Uh, we, we incorporate a water fountain on the outside so even if our facility is locked in the weekends, there's a water fountain to get water and things like that. Uh, we also incorporate a new water fountain with inside our facility that allows you to refill bottles. It has a new refill bottle thing. So if people come in bottles, they can fill them up and stuff like that. Um, we, we incorporate new signs on our deck and we have some uh, rocking chairs and some, and some benches that are now there for people to be able to sit. So uh, we really do en enjoy the new look and it's a wider thing and it's, it's definitely was a time for an upgrade and we'll be continuing to do stuff. Our next phase is really to look at the parking lot area. Uh, so the last three years we're working with Framingham University studying our reptiles and amphibians in the preserve and most recently we've been focusing mostly on our turtles in the ponds. As most of you know, um, if you've been in Axe Woods, we have quite a few ponds in there, close to 64 different ponds based on how much water we've had. And this summer we had a lot of water, so we had a lot of ponds. So we've had a couple of students that are using basically uh, fight nets, which are nets that go across the pond. They have ends and they have floats in them, and so the turtles hit the thing and they go to one side or the other. And we do mark and recapture and stuff like that. Uh, we had identified over 400 different new turtles this year. Most of your yellow bellies, uh, snapping turtles are the ones we get the highest numbers. Uh, and then we get mark and recapture. So now we have enough data for the last three years of doing this that we can start looking at population dynamics. We can also start looking at sex ratios and things like that. Um, so the student that I've been working with, uh, he just finished up his school and we're going through the data actually the next month or so. And we're hoping to be able to publish something coming out of some of our work. Uh, deer management, as always, uh, you know, there was discussion of management of wildlife. Deers are one of those species that you do have to manage when you have these urban interface places. Uh, and one of our ways of doing it is using the bow hunting program. Uh, so we still work with WRC. Uh, it is a $50 fee for anyone to come in. Uh, it's bow only. Uh, no firearms allowed within town ordinance. So, but we actually get good, we get good participation from the hunters. A lot of the returning hunters uh, last year, uh, we had 34 registered hunters. Right now we're up to... 20 registered hunters for the season. The season just started this past Saturday. Uh, usually as things get cooler, I get a little more uh, hunters coming wanting to come in as things cool off and stuff like that. But it does, it did start, it goes through January 1, and then we are within the urban extended season, which goes from this year, it goes from January 13th, I think, to February 19th or something like that. But we get an extra four weeks. That is something that we enrolled next at Woods in. It's not something that's offered and, and other places, but with the urban interface, it is a way that we get to extend our season to try to allow the hunters to, you know, help us manage the deer herd. And it also gives uh, people that type of resource and that type of outdoor activity to do. Uh, we've also been working on our pollinator habitat. Uh, we kind of started this originally with the ADA trail. Uh, when we when we started working with the town to, do, to, to uh, look at that four-acre parcel down there, and we built the ADA hiking trail, we started doing some pollinator gardeners down there. Well, we looked at it with Dominion Power, and Dominion Power really liked the idea. They have a lot of power line they have to manage, and we have to manage that with them, with vegetation being the high thing. So a lot of those places, Lob Lolly Ponds are fastest growing things, and usually one of the species that um, Dominion Power just doesn't like to manage. So uh, we've gotten some funding with them, and we started looking at doing more pollinator type species, and these are low growing, flowering type things, good for bees, good for butterflies, stuff like that. Also really great for power line areas uh, because they don't require as much management. They don't require, you know, coming in with heavy machinery or chainsaws. And in most cases, once you step them, you're less likely to have to use herbicides and things of that nature. Uh, and we're all looking at native things. So we've been working with the North Carolina Aquarium to look at some of the, the, natural, some of the native pollinator species that you would have around here. 
things of that nature. So we've just started doing that in different blocks. We're trying to see what works best in our sandy soils, what we'll take, what won't. Uh, but it's been a good relationship. We've had a good relationship with Dominion Power, and they're excited about it. And they've been funding it and working with us to try to see if we can establish those things. Uh, so we kind of come to Fresh Pond. Um, this, I guess, kind of came in response that the towns were hearing from, you know, public access, access to Fresh Pond and what could be done in Fresh Pond, things like that. Uh, I think it was about a year ago uh, that we talked with both towns of Killow Hills and Axe Head. We also had Wildlife Resource Commission come in uh, to get their input. As you know, Wildlife Resource Commission are the ones that manage freshwater fishing and things of that nature, hunting as well. Uh, so we did some sampling with uh, with their biologists uh, back in September of last year. And, you know, one of the assessments from the report is it has a good largemouth bass relationship, healthy population and things like that. Uh, so it does have the potential for fishing and things like that. Uh, within that, uh, there's not a lot of great access and there's a lot of town resources that need to be protected within Fresh Pond too. Uh, because of the possibility of drinking water, you also have, you know, the, the firing range over there, it's used by all the Dare County, things like that. So those areas have to be secured. Uh, so, so my suggestion uh, last year in the winter was to look at making sure the gates are established. If you see that map there, you see the pink lines, and those are where you would establish kind of fenced off areas, gated areas. The one to the south where, the first, where you see the north arrow, that would be basically where the firing range is. Um, so this past spring, we actually worked with uh, the Nags Head Police Department, and we started securing up that area with the fence uh, and putting new signs up in that thing. And I know that this, uh, I guess it would be late spring, early summer, KDH also put their fence along that northern area. I've kind of flagged off where the park is on that GIS map and that pink area, which would be kind of the line that, that the town put to secure off their side. The blue line that you see that leads down to the fishing site, it would be an extension off of our current trails. The red line is our Sweet Gum Swamp Trail that is currently out there. So people, if they want, if we were to look at doing this and having access to it uh, via B, Next Head Woods, you'd be parking at our parking center and you'd be walking in on part of our already established trails and then we would do an extension down to it. Um, from basically our office all the way in is just over a mile. Now it does contain topography up and down, but it's not, it's not unreasonable. Um, if we were to do that, we would open up some areas within this, um, basically the western side of Fresh Pond so that people would have access to that. And if things were to go positively and, and we did we saw the relationship between the people accessing the pond and no other types of things were going on, you could always look at floating docks or you could look at places where they've done piers that, that hug the shorelines and stuff like that. Um, you can look at improving uh, the habitat with, with along certain shorelines because they can't have access to everywhere. You can look off doing submerged habitat so it brings in some of the smaller fishes which therefore brings in some large mouth bass if you're containing them in the areas. Um, the other thing that this would do uh, is it, it does get a lot of waterfowl, uh, so waterfowl viewing in the wintertime, as Fresh Pond is one of our biggest fresh ponds, it is actually pretty obvious from the air, and so therefore you do see certain types of ducks and other types of waterfowl hanging out in this area. Uh, so, but I do want to say that we already do allow fishing, and so I don't know how obvious that was, uh, and so when this kind of came up within uh, last year's discussion of fishing fresh pond and fishing out place, we kind of started working uh, both with the towns and we had, we basically came up with a brochure that identified the fish species, identified the location, stated what the rules were by the state and stated what some of our rules are. Our rules within our ponds are catch and release. Um, we have two access. We have two access for freshwater fishing. The ADA, which is ADA compliance, so wheelchairs can go in there and fish from that pond. And the discovery pond, which is fishable. Uh, both of those are within a 500 yards from our parking lot. So those are already being accessed, and we have actually a lot of kids that fish our ponds. Uh, they're in there quite frequently in the summer. And you also have access to fish uh, to the sound, both from our Roanoke Trail and from our town trail. Both lead down to the sound and allow access for wading and fishing for estuarine-type species. And so we also have fly fishermen that go back in there, and we'll fish for uh, seeing the guys catching uh, puppy drum, speckled sea trout, and things like that as well. So. I don't, want just, I don't want it just to be said that Fresh Pond is the only place that you can freshwater fish. It's not. There is access, and we're trying to improve our education and get the word out that there already is access to places. So um, it's not limited to just this one thing. I think if Fresh Pond wants to be looked at for access, that's fine. Um, 
and we can look at trying to give minimum access. I still, th still think there's resources around that the towns need to protect, and I'm aware of that. And so I want to make sure that in the, in the process of, of opening up access that we allow and we make sure that the towns are able to secure what they need to secure up. And we want to look at this resource and make sure that we don't damage this resource in the process of opening up. So it would require, uh, you know, keeping an eye on how, 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 how much activity is going back in there, what type of stuff is going on. Uh, wildlife cameras are always a good way to see, trying to get a count of what's going on in those areas. Um, and you probably feasibly would have to come back every so often to work with WRC to relook at the population, the fish population, and stuff like that. Um, but those are always good things. You can, like I said, you can improve habitat in there. You could even look at, as WRC uh, suggested in their report, you could add catfish to those samples to increase different types of species diversity. Um, does anyone have any questions on that? So our fence has already gone up. Uh, on the next head side, I mean, or side, you have the, uh, the line there. Mm -hmm. Is a fence already started there? The fence is all the way from uh, the road all the way back into through the woods and down to a pound. So the majority of it is the biggest part that would need to be done would have to be a gated area to allow passage through on the sandy road around Fresh Pond. Okay. So there's a section where the gate would need to go in out towards the pond so that people couldn't pass towards the south. So it's not completed, but a big chunk of it, a majority of it through the woods, the maritime forest, has all been done. <clears throat> uh, and once again, like if this was something that the town's wishes to do, uh, and we, want, we decide to run it through the way that I've suggested through our ad extension trail, TNC would manage the trail. We would make sure that we work with the visitors to make sure they have adequate access to places they need to. Um, and we would sign it and things like that, so to improve that type of stuff. And I'll work with WRC to make sure that they have uh, the understanding of access and stuff like that, as, as they are the ones that manage uh, fisheries and things of that nature. Yeah, Aaron, you said uh, there was four deer taken last year. Last year was a pretty slow year. Um, yeah. Matthew was a big <laughs> round everywhere, um, so I didn't really get the hunter participation uh, that I normally see. I also We also had a hard time really finding the deer. Uh, Matthew probably pushed deer around and displaced them to an extent. A lot of acorns and everything fell early. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of different things that probably went into that. But most of the things was I really just didn't have the hunter participation. 34 registered hunters, but not a lot of hours. And that's and that was just the case. I, I rely on a handful of hunters that really spend time in Axet Woods, but they were busy with construction work and doing other stuff. They just weren't in there as much as they normally are. We have hunters that take the majority of their deer uh, from the Axe Head Woods, and if those guys only take one from there and they don't take four, you know, three or four, it's a big difference. That's a hard place to hunt. Topography plays a big role. Um, we have a lot of activity on that dirt road during the hunting season, so that type of d disturbance can keep deer in one place. Um, and neighborhoods, deer like to be in the neighborhoods. If they've got a food source and they don't have any pressure to be out of those things, they're not necessarily going to leave those areas. Um, so there's a lot of different things. We definitely saw deer. We have wildlife cameras up, and we definitely were seeing deer on the cameras and things like that. But as far as getting the hunter being able to get uh, time in there or to be able to get shots off, that's a different story. You would have probably liked to see more taken, I'm sure. Well, I mean, it's 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 a give or take. I, I, I you know, if we're not seeing a browse line, we're not seeing damage in our forest from deer browsing, mm -hmm. uh, so that's good. Uh, we're seeing acorns left from the ground. So I mean, generally, if you were to go to a forest and you see where there's very little vegetation on the ground. You can walk, see through the canopy. That's usually a sign of browsing. Last time we looked at the deer, and when I looked at deer that are harvested, uh, their their fat levels on their kidneys and stuff looks good. So those look like the thing. And we are seeing uh, does with fawns. So that's good. I mean, so you know, there's. But as far as uh, what I like to see is make sure that we offer this resource to our hunters here, so they have the chance to do it. And whatever whatever we're able to harvest is um, good. I know that there was also mentions of coyotes and things like that. Some of our hunters do see coyotes. Um, there is um, the ability to take coyotes in Exit Woods. Dare County does have a permit for coyotes, so all my hunters know that if they have the proper permits, they have the right to do a butt bow in there. So it's not like that that's cut off from those things. That you know, sometimes you have to manage multiple different species uh, to manage the woods and things like that. So I want to make that clear as well. And so this year could be, you could see a lot more activity, or we could see nothing. If it comes that we're not taking the deer that we need to, we continue to look at them. First thing we would do is go back and look at the health of the herd. It may not be a numbers thing. 
the health of the herd may be fine. We just may not have as many deer in there as we thought. Uh, this is just a brief slide on our uh, outreach and community events. Uh, so we do offer hikes in the woods. We did offer hikes all summer. Uh, they were free to the public. Uh, we did stuff on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, Wednesday was a hike through about the ecology of the maritime forest, and Thursday was a reptile and amphibian talk and hike. Um, because I've had these great students from Framingham that loved to talk about turtles and hold snakes, it really was a great way to get people out there where uh, they usually will bring in a few of the turtles that they've caught and things like that. So we really can let people experience, see how to handle certain types of things, and hopefully become more comfortable for reptiles and amphibians around here. Um, that, like I said, was offered uh, basically from the start of June all the way through August. It was free to the public. And then on Thursdays, we did an open house where uh, we had tables set up, a lot of kind of hands-on things with signs, anywhere from um, pollinator-type plant species and how to identify certain stuff to a lot of turtle shells to oyster reef stuff and all that different in between. Uh, this past year, we had over 1,000 hours of volunteer services. Um, we had over 300 different volunteers come in from Boy Scout groups to uh, multiple universities coming down for, sh for alternative spring breaks. Uh, they helped do a lot of work uh, with us. They were some of the kids that were helping us fix men fences. Uh, they helped pull invasive plants. Uh, they helped do a lot, of, a lot of the grunt work and different things that come through. Uh, I had quite a few hunters help after Matthew with, with when we had trees down and stuff like that come through. So a wide variety, but, but in general, I think it's really great that you see that, that we get close to over a 1,000 hours every year that helps to, to support Nagshead Woods and the stewardship that goes around in those areas. And then one other thing I wanted to, to uh, just kind of show you guys is uh, Laura Eddy, who works for the Nature Conservancy and is, our, is dealing with coastal resilience in this area. You may be familiar with her and some of the work. She's been working with all the different towns in Dare County. Uh, one of the last things she worked with you guys was community rating system, looking at open space and green space. Well, she's been working with and getting input uh, to look at other things to add to this app vigilation, hurricane storm surges, looking at sea level rise, and looking at shallow flooding and things like that due to rain events. So I know that these are concerns that you all, these were topics that were brought up today. Um, there's tools out there to try to help you guys think about things, um, making decisions and stuff like that. And uh, we want to work with you guys. Um, she's there. If you guys have questions about this, we would like to improve on this stuff. So it's always about getting the more data, the more newer, newer the data you get. A lot of this is through GIS. The better off these tools can be to help assist you guys in thinking about things. These are decision-based tools. They're trying to make you think. They're not necessarily going to give you the answer. But at least when you can see them on these at this type of scale, I think it can really shine light on the bigger picture of what's going on around here. Uh, that's my presentation. I'm um, happy to uh, discuss this in more details at any point. I'm happy to go out and look at Fresh Pond or anything that we do in Axehead Woods at any point. Uh, if you have questions, you're, feel free to give me a call on my cell phone or drop an email. But thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for all of the, the information. Um, it's such such a tremendous asset in our community and um, and I'm proud of, of the partnership that we have and, and the great stewardship that, that you provide. So thank well, you. We thank the towns as well. Um, next on our agenda is recognition of Ben Sproul. Ben, I know you're here. We walked in together. There you are. Um, and actually, as you come up, I think I'd also like to invite, Ben, if you don't mind coming up front, um, the planning board. Gosh, we have quite a few planning board members that I think they're here for you. <laughs> Maybe they're here for a meeting, too. But um, Stan Cloud, the chairman of the planning board, Eddie Valdivizio, James Omni, um, Skip Jones, John uh, Winley. You guys all come up for it. I appreciate you being here. Every day clothes, what are you talking about? So for anyone who doesn't know, Ben has been on the planning board 
It's almost been 11 years now. Um, it's been a lost show. And, <laughs> and has done a tremendous job on the planning board. His input um, when the you know, planning board's vetting issues and whatnot has, has been tremendous. And we really appreciate all of your service and the years you've dedicated to the town. And this is a token of our appreciation from the town. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you want to say a few words or if any of your planning board members? Oh gosh, it's not that Glad big of a deal. I really I really enjoyed it all these years and if there's ever anything I could do to help the town, just let me know. Thank you. Have a lot. Yeah, absolutely. we have um, two appointments to the Community Appearance Committee or Commission. Um, Bambo, Char Lambos, and Natalie Painter's terms on the Community Appearance Commission um, are expiring in October. Both have expressed interest in staying on or being reappointed to the board. Um, so we'd like to take action on that. That would be great. I'll make a motion we reappoint both uh, Bambos, Char Lambos, and Natalie Painter. To the Community Appearance Commission. I'll second. Okay. Um, any comments, discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I would like to draw to everyone's attention that we do have, in fact, then we could sign you right back up, buddy. <laughs> um, we do have, It's. we still will have one vacancy on that um, Community Appearance Board. So um, if anyone's interested or knows someone, we are looking for someone to join the Community Appearance Board. Um, just let us know if you're interested, or um, you can contact um, the office and get an application as well. So, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I had to throw it out there. <laughs> anyway. um, all right, so with that, we will move on to the commissioner's agenda. Uh, nothing for me tonight. So, the only thing I have, I was wondering, Mr. Mike was a, a good example um, as I was trying to get out of Ocean Acres and turn left on to. Past. Have we heard anything on the um, stoplights and what the DOT is potentially looking at on, on doing there? Oh, yes, sir. And I think the mayor has an update. Um, I think we just got something today. Okay. And um, I think Mayor Davies, that is on. It is. I was going to cover, um, and then we can share this. We literally um, just received um, well, just received a copy today of the letter. Um, so I'll. In fact, I'll read that during the mayor's agenda. If that's okay. Right. But yes, we do have an update from NCDOT. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Nothing I see. Yeah, um, I don't know if anybody noticed though. They're starting to work on the skating rink, um, taking the old one down anyway. And I uh, talked to Ross uh, from our buildings and grounds a couple weeks ago, along with Debbie. And uh, Ross uh, had the idea a couple years ago, actually. And, him and I talked about it at the time of uh, putting basketball hoops there at the rink and it, how it would be done would be the poles would be outside the fence so they wouldn't interfere with any skaters or anything and um, they also have uh, the things that hold the backboard are usually four feet from the post but they make a model that's six feet from the post so that would get it further in and uh, Maybe if we find out that it's necessary, we could put up a, a screening behind there in case they miss the basketball. They don't have to go around the, the gate and climb the fence every time to get the ball. And Debbie thought that there might be some money in the budget for that. Probably. Doing some research. Okay. So that's something that uh, is kind of cool, I think. So we'll be looking forward to that. I don't, we don't have any basketball courts yet. Yes. Yeah. That would be a busy place there with the skate park and, and the uh, skateboard. Yeah. That's 
great. We literally were just, my husband and I chatting the other night about basketball, outdoor, and um, the only one we are aware of is by the First Light Schools, well, in Kitty Hawk Elementary School, but that's great, so thank you. Anything else this evening? No, that's just We'll move to Mayor's agenda, and you guys bear with me. I do have quite a few things this evening. Um, so first, and these, um, some of the information I'm going to cover is in your packet, some is not. Um, first are a couple of proclamations that were in the board packet this evening. Um, the first one being Fire Prevention Week is um, October 8th through the 14th. Um, and the, the message that's being shared is part of um, this National Fire Prevention Association. And Fire Week is every second counts. Plan two ways out. That's this year's slogan. And um, focusing on encouraging everyone to think ahead, plan ahead on what would be your safe route out of a house and where you would go in the event of a fire. Um, so I would ask for, um, I'll make a motion for the board and ask for your support in adopting the proclamation um, declaring October 8th through the 14th as Fire Prevention Week in Killable Hills. I'll second. Discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, and I will share along with Fire Prevention Week that the fire department is having or hosting their um, open house <coughs> on Tuesday, October 10th from 5 to 7 at the fire department. Um, there will be all kinds of activities for the whole family and even some delicious food. Um, Chief, anything you want to add to that about the event or Fire Prevention Week? Or? Mayor, I think you covered it well. Okay. Thank you. Just want to make sure you're happy. <laughs> All right, great. Well, please pr please bring the family out. We, we have been there. Um, it's always a fun event. So and great to see uh, all the firefighters there and tour the trucks. So um, Next, this is in your packet, is the proclamation um, declaring October 2017 as Disability Employment Awareness Month. This is held every October, calls attention to disability employment issues, and celebrates the many and varied contributions of America's workers with disabilities. Um, the theme this year for the Disability Employment Awareness Month is Inclusion Drives Innovation. And with that, I would like to make a motion to adopt the proclamation declaring October 2017 as Disab Disability Employ Employment Awareness Month. I'll second that. Any discussion, comments? All those in favor, please signify saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, next is I did want to share the letter that um, I've received. Uh, this is in response, if you'll recall, back in May um, at our meeting, we agreed or provided consensus to uh, for me to send a letter to Jerry Jennings um, requesting consideration for a signal light and study sequence, a signal light um, at Avalon Drive and uh, the sequencing that you're referencing at Ocean Acres Drive, Neptune Drive, and US 58, so along that. So I'll share this um, letter by email, but um, I'll just read it briefly so it updates everyone. Um, so the response, this is in reference to the correspondence from the Kittleba Hills Town Commissioners to investigate the subject intersection for the installation of a traffic signal. Traffic counts were taken at this location on July 27, 2017. Traffic counts at this area were below the minimum volumes that are required by the Federal Highway Administration to warrant the installation of a traffic signal. Uh, the most recent crass information in our database for this location was reviewed over a five-year period from May 1, 2012 through April 30, 2017. The data show that there were 10 reported crashes in the vicinity of US 158 and Avalon Drive. Of these crashes, none were considered correctable by the installation of a traffic signal. The Federal Highway Administration minimum warrants for crashes are five correctable crashes over the latest one-year review period. Based on the infrequency of reported accidents combined with low traffic volumes, the installation of a traffic signal at this location is not warranted at this time. As part of this request, the town also referenced converting the current one-way pattern on Avalon Drive to a two-way traffic pattern. If the town would still like to proceed with this action, NCDOT would be glad to assist as needed. 
Also, we were asked to review the timing of the traffic signals at the intersections of Ocean Acres Drive and Neptune Drive where they meet US 158. We have reviews, reviewed these locations over the summer months and have made changes accordingly. We continue to monitor this area and will make any other changes as needed. We appreciate your interest in highway safety. As conditions change at this location, we will be glad to review the area again at the town's request. If we can be of any further assistance or provide additional information, please do not hesitate to contact us. And that was signed by one of their traffic engineers. So re regarding the investigation related to the light at Avalon, obviously for the reason cited in here, they it's, it's not warranted and so they can't justify putting a light there. Um, as far as the two-way traffic pattern, um, uh, they're, I guess, open to further discussion if that's what we want. And then they noted that they addressed Ocean Acres. <laughs> but I think you just said this evening you didn't. Well, you felt like you were sitting there a while. Um, but they said that they could look at it again as needed as well. Well, the, if, if they made any changes, I'd love to know exactly what they did. I mean, in the summer months, it's you can't. They, they fill up the intersection between Neptune and, and Ocean Acres. Um, most of the time blocking the McDonald's or the old intersection. So then either you're trying to turn out of McDonald's or trying to turn out of Ocean Acres and you cannot. Or, or the people that are catching that red light will just sort of go through the orange light and fill up the, uh, the, tra the roadways and then you can't turn either. Now, I sometimes fight fire with fire, and I'll block the intersection as well with my truck because that's the only way you're going to get out. Um, and that's in the summer. Today was obviously less traffic, and it was still full, and I had to sit out in the intersection to make the meeting. So, well, how about um, we do a follow-up letter just on this? I mean, I, I feel like the the information that was provided in this letter was very detailed regarding um, the the crash study that they did, as well as the traffic counts on July 27th, specifically that date. Um, maybe a letter just to this. We'll bring, you know, asking one more time to look at this and study just this in isolation. Give it a little more attention, possibly. Mm -hmm. Is that good with the board? Absolutely. Okay. Um, Commissioner Alpine, maybe we'll get some input from you since you're dealing with it di directly on a daily basis. I'd love to provide it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just, I'd hate for an accident to happen there sure. that, you know, could easily be avoidable. And we certainly don't want to wait for five. Or road rage. Yeah. That's <laughs> ridiculous. Red rage. Red rage. Red rage. I mean, I'll park in the middle of the road, but no road rage. So. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so good next step. That's on the record, you know. <laughs> so you know. Um, a couple of other, a few more other things. Um, wanted to acknowledge on September 1st, um, Fire Captain Pete Turek retired after 21 years of service with the town. So special thanks to Pete for all he's done for the town, our community, and certainly his service to the fire department. Um, also want to note the um, town of Kittleville Hills was honored by the North Carolina Coastal Federation for exercising leadership to ensure an oil-free North Carolina coast, and we received the 2016 Pelican Award. According to Bone, one of the main reasons for its decision to remove the Atlantic Ocean from its five-year plan in March 2016 was the 31 coastal governments opposed, uh, opposition of, of the draft plan, and this should ensure that these pristine waters will be free from gas and oil. Uh, development through 2022. So thanks for all of our advocacy and hard work and promotion um, promoting this. So thank you for holding up our Pelican Award. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice honor. Um, mark your calendars for September 26th from 4.30 to 7.30. That's our annual ice cream social. If you have not been to this event, you've been missing something because it's absolutely a wonderful event. Um, goodness, between 200, 250, sometimes even 300 oh, folks come out and enjoy this. Um, so there's a, a flyer here. We'll be circulating on Facebook. Um, certainly we want all of our KDH folks to come out, but it's not just for KDH folks. We'll share the love with our other neighboring towns as well. So please come out. It really is a fun event. 
Um, there's no charge, and um, live music is going to be provided by the First Flight High School Jazz Band. There'll be a 50-50 raffle to benefit our fire auxiliary. In addition to hot dog, I mean to hot dog, to ice cream, there's also hot dogs, hamburgers, chips, and drinks. So please mark your calendars. Um, Tuesday, September 26, 4.30 to 7.30. The rain date is, which hopefully won't happen, the following day is 27th of September. So. No, don't. Okay. No. <laughs> we can enjoy this event this time. Um, and the fire department and the auxiliary will be cooking the hot dogs and, and hamburgers. Yeah, we have a lot of our staff working there, too. I know the assistant chief is usually in charge of milkshakes. There's always a nice yep. line. For right. we, we, really, we really do have excellent participation from the employees. We yeah, do. Really. They really work hard. Yes. We couldn't do the event without them. Yeah. Um, another event to mark your calendar for is Friday, October 6, from 2 to 5 p.m. That's the Historic Landmark Open House Tour. This is an opportunity to actually visit um, some of the historic properties in our town. So if you haven't done that before, that's open to the public. Um, love for you to join us on that tour. I already mentioned the Fire Department Open House. Again, it's Tuesday, October 10th, from 5 to 7. Just loading up your calendar, so here we go, a few more. <laughs> um, on Wednesday, October 4th at 7 p.m. is the League of Women Voter Forum for KDH. They'll be doing these in each of the different towns, but that's the night that's specific for the KDH upcoming election. Again, that is Wednesday, October 4th at 7 p.m. Um, and another note, um, the early voting starts this time. I know sometimes it's been at the Bomb Center, but this year, Early voting will actually be here in Kettleville Hills. Uh, it's going to start on October 18th. It's going to run Monday through Friday here from 10 to 2 p.m. 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Manio has Saturday hours, but this is just a Monday through Friday site, and it runs up to the Friday before the November 7th election. So, I um, also want to note um, we received, and the board received an email. Um, where Chief Tilly, Chief Tilly had shared details about one of our lifeguard, um, Todd Guzenhauser, did I say that? Close, maybe? <laughs> um, where he um, basically, through his, his quick response and service, um, had a save, <coughs> I think it was on his last day with us, right before he was leaving for school, is when he actually had the save. Um, so, in addition to saving, truly saving the life of someone that was in distress in the water, um, it just his quick action and, and the family wrote a, a really nice thank you and provided comments on that. So, um, uh, information will go out. But was this his first year with us or no? Was he I'm trying to remember? If, I would call that man. I think it was his first year with us, and it was on this, this last day here. Not, not many years. Yeah, but I understand he's um, already interested in coming back, which is great, too. So um, so certainly thank you to, um, to to Todd, but also all of our Ocean Rescue guards and, and um, Dave and, and Ben for their leadership for that through the summer and all their hard work. So um, do you have something you wanted to share? Oh, the one I was just sharing? No, that's the place where it changed the entire Oh, okay. Um, yeah, just another email that we had received about a lifeguard who um, just was a great good Samaritan and helped a lady who needed a tire changed. And um, she was at the Kittle Hills Library. Library with her young child. Yeah. Passing by. And he got out of the car and he could hear her tire hissing was going flat as they stood there. And her husband was out of time, and she couldn't get a hold of her brother, so he changed the tire for her. Yeah. It wouldn't take any money, of course. Pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, <coughs> great, great stuff. And that is all I have this evening, I think, unless I'm hoping I didn't leave anything out with all that. But I think I covered it. Can I add something? Please, please. I have, yeah, my brain is elsewhere. Um, as you were going through the list of things that people need to add to their calendars. I need to add the Alzheimer's walk that we have at Spring Arbor every year. Um, it will be on October the 7th at 9.30. And um, we always have KDH 
representation there. The fire department um, usually comes, and that's that's a big day. We walk from Spring Arbor to the Bomb Center and back, which doesn't seem like a lot, but for some people, that's a pretty big walk, and that's a pretty big day where there's lots of representation. All the money that's raised on that day stays locally here in Dare County now, so um, it's a either for um, educational purposes or respite care for those who have dementia. So um, last year we raised somewhere between fourteen and fifteen thousand dollars. So that's a that's a pretty big walk. So um, put that on your calendar for October the seventh, and hopefully we'll have really good weather on that day too. Great, thanks. And one last thing I did think of. Um, did we did you have a question related no, to that? Nine a.m. Yes, nine. Nine thirty. 9.30. That's okay. Since our um, last meeting, most of you know um, that the plastic bag van peel was um, repealed. So, um, as despite our advocacy efforts and um, proclamations and letters, um, that's the decision that was made. I will share at the um, Dare County Board of Commissioners meeting um, just last week, uh, there were a number of folks who spoke and expressed their displeasure with that decision and pleaded to the Deer County Board of Commissioners to see what action they could take, maybe even discussing um, considering a referendum and so on and so forth. Um, Chairman Bob Woodard came out very vocal of stating that obviously he was very disappointed with the decision and pledged to do whatever he could do um, to lead efforts to see what can be done on a local level. So I just figured um, share that and then keep you all apprised of anything that I hear. Um, this, this board has gone on record a number of times expressing um, our opposition to the repeal. And so um, if there's opportunity for us to take action in the future, we'll put that back in front of us. So. Okay. With that, then we will move on to the town manager's agenda. Town Attorney's agenda? Nothing for me, Mayor. Okay, the consent agenda. Yes, Mayor. Three items on the consent agenda. The first is the um, minutes from the August 14th, 2017 meeting. Second um, item is two budget amendments. The first one is to record the encumbrances outstanding as of June 30th and to rebudget funds for the disc golf course um, that were not spent during the 16th, 17th fiscal year. Um, and lastly, the fireworks for July 4th, 2018. Uh, approval of the consent agenda will record the board's consensus um, approval to increase the budget for this event to 30000 and to commit to a fireworks show on July 4th, 2018 uh, by the same company that did our celebration this year. And I'd like to thank the fire chief for his diligence in getting that date locked in for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Questions about the consent agenda? Mm -hmm. Not a motion? Make a motion we approve the uh, consent agenda as presented. A second. Any other discussion? Others in favor, please say no, saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we are now back to the second time set aside this evening for public comment. Would anyone like to? Yes, Matt, welcome. Yeah, while Matt comes to the, um, the podium, and if I could just have one more second, um, I didn't. I, I neglected to, to say this about the um, about the fireworks. Yeah. We will be applying for additional grant monies to um, so our increase on that would, would be half of the ten. So we'd be looking at additional five in the budget, and hopefully the visitors bureau would be able to um, grant us the fifteen thousand. Great. Thank you. Sorry, Matt. Oh, it's all good. Floor is yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt Walker, 439 West Walker Street. I'm actually here for surf rider stuff. I should have said this when the room was more crowded, but Beach Sweep this year is September 23rd. That's where we do the pickup from 9 a.m. to noon at Darius Beach Axis from, what, Chickahawk to Jeanette's, I believe. You can go to the site at uh, surfrider.outerbanks.org, outerbanks.surfrider.org. Go to the Facebook page. It's a lot easier. Um, and it'll show all the accesses. If you pick up trash from 9 a.m. to noon, please come out. Go to the after party at the brew station afterwards. This would be a good year to be looking for plastic bags or the lack thereof. Because um, uh. the more we can document not being there this year, then when they try to tell us that there's tons of bags on the beach, we can show them that there weren't until whatever, 12 months from now. That might help the cause. Um, that also, in addition, is part of a larger thing called Surf Loris, which is going to happen three different nights. Uh, Jeanette's Pier on that Thursday night, 21st. 
uh, 22nd at uh, Arts, Arts Cancel Manio, and then back to the British Station on the 23rd, three different nights of surf films, and the one in on the Thursday night, excuse me, Friday night at the Arts Council is actually going to have a little Mickey McCarthy tribute thing with all those photos, tribute stuff like that. So, surfalaris.org for that. That's legit. I know that. And um, <laughs> thank you very much for all your support, and congrats on the Brown Pelican Award. You might get another shot of winning that, too, it looks like. So, fortunately. But thank you. Thanks for respond to the public comment, but thank you, Matt, for bringing that up, and um, we can share that page. Or so live, yeah. That would be great. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, with that, anything else before we adjourn? Just to remind people about the land use plan. Thank Sorry. you. Yes, thank you. Yep. Um, postcards were dropped the end of last week in the mail. Um, I haven't seen one yet, but we, did, we are sending out a postcard um, to all property owners um, and copies anybody wants a hard copy um, just to basically tell people about the land use plan survey encourage them to go to survey monkey and take it you also can if you don't want to do it electronically you can pick up a copy at the library here at town hall um, the bomb the center. center so um, thank you for bringing that up yes please 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 we want a large uh, response so if you haven't taken the land use survey yet please do we're keeping the link open until 29th the 29th and the postcards are trickling out i mean they, they got mailed so you should be getting them but without the postcards just through social media we have over 700 um, responses that's so, responses so far but we still need a lot more because i think historically we're in 2000 2500 range so let's share that widely with your friends as well Okay, with that, a motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. I'll second. Anything else? All those in favor, please signal saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Aye.